So welcome everybody to the fifth uh, Tika talk. The Tika talks are an online seminar happening once a month that is put on by the International Composite Alliance. And uh, we're continuing our trip around the world and uh, looking at the diversity of comps in Australia today. Um, I don't know if Mauricio is here, he may have a announcement, but if anybody else wants to make any announcements um, before we get started, you're welcome to do so. Maybe, maybe he'll uh, show up at the end and make an announcement. Otherwise, I'll, I'll pass it off to, um, to Bort, who's going to introduce our speaker for today. All right. Uh, thanks, Isaac. Cool. Um, so yeah, just uh, I guess in brief. So um, as I understand it, Alexander almost escaped being sucked into the world of Composite. Um, his doctoral work was at the University of Göttingen. I hope I got that right, in Germany, um, where he explored a South American mint genus, uh, Minthostachys, um, from a number of different angles. Um, that included ethnobotany, biochemistry, phylogenetics, systematics, and um, the ploidy of the group, which is really cool. So bringing together a lot of different uh, lines of data and, and elements, which was uh, really cool. Um, but apparently he was keen to find a plant family that was even bigger and offered him even more opportunity to explore lots of different angles. Um, so after a couple of postdocs, he took a research scientist position at CSIRO, which is the uh, Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, um, Australia's sort of government um, research body. Uh, that was in 2010. Um, Canberra uh, is where he's based, um, which is also my hometown and my stomping ground from undergraduate university. So I bumped into him um, at a regular systematics beer in the pub discussions. Um, long before I was forced to develop my own interest in Composite. Um, and it was Alexander's thoughtful and really firmly grounded technical knowledge across a whole range of topics um, from phylogenetics and systematics and semantics and methodology and philosophy and even social history um, that really left a lasting impression on me. Um, and he sort of expresses this through his work, which um, sort of specifically is uh, sort of thoughtful and rigorous insight into the systematics and evolution of flowering plants and in particular the compositae um, and compositae and biogeography in Australia which offers him plenty of uh, room to explore. Uh, he's published numerous taxonomic treatments across disparate groups within the family. Um, he's also an avid outdoors enthusiast. I'm sure we'll see plenty of his pictures today which will be great. Um, and he's going to be talking on the diversity of the Australian Composite, recent progress in phylogenetics and biogeography. So uh, thank you, Alexander. Um, let's take it away. Thank you very much, Bord. I'm not sure I deserve all that very kind praise that you've given me. <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough act to uh, deliver on now. Thank you. Um, everybody can see the slides? Yep. Yep, good, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for that introduction and thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I'm very, very grateful to be able to speak about the diversity of Australian daisies. And uh, the way I thought I'd um, structure this is to give an overview of a few disparate elements that will then in, in summary give you um, a relatively broad sample of our flora and a few recent scientific results. So in a sense, you could say this is uh, two conference talks and two lightning talks in scope, so to say. I'm going to start very, very quickly by giving an overview of the diversity uh, that we have in Australia at the tribal level and where we've got the most species. Then I'm going to talk about a paper that uh, some of you, especially those interested in Sinisionia, may have already seen that we published last year about uh, phylogeny of Sinisionia. And then uh, talk about the largest tribe in Australia, the Nephali, uh, primarily on phylogenetic results that will be published soon in Taxon, and uh, then a few notes at the end on phylogenetic diversity. So the Australian daisy flora is actually fairly lopsided in uh, where it has recruited from different tribes. By far the largest tribe we have in Australia are the Nephali, uh, which account for slightly under half of the native species that we have. And the second largest one are the Asteria, and the third largest one are the Senecionia, and together they account for uh, say pro approximately 90% of our native species. 
So Australia is absolutely dominated by uh, this, you know, large five tribes clade in the Asteroidae. And all the other tribes um, have got little incursions here or there in the southeast or in the southwest or in the north, but account for only, you know, the, the scattered rest of that. In addition, and, and that is what, you know, my uh, first larger aspect in this talk is also going to delve in a bit. Uh, as you will all know, the Asteraceae are also one of the top weed families on the planet. So in addition to those around 1,000, 1,100 perhaps native species that are known at the moment, we also got an enormous number of introduced weeds in Australia, and some of them are quite uh, impactful and weeds of national significance. So because you, you will have seen just now, we've got Nafalia, Asteria, and uh, Sinisio as the three large tribes in Australia, but I'm only going to talk really about the Nafalia and the Sinisio. I thought I'd start by showing just a few photos for those who are interested in Asteria, just to show you a few of the genera that we've got here. And in the Asteria, the most important genera are um, Brachiscombe and Olearia. So Brachiscombe is, is a fairly generic little herbaceous daisy genus uh, with a couple dozen species. And uh, in fact, it looks at first sight so generic that the first few species were described as bellus um, by European explorers. And then Olearia is a shrubby genus that is uh, certainly non-monophyletic. Um, one of Randy Bar's students published on that already uh, many years ago. But in its current circumscription, it's the largest uh, genus of daisies in Australia and uh, with over 100 species. And this is an alpine species here, just as an example. And then uh, one that I like particularly well in the, in the uh, estuary is this calotis here, the bird daisies. Um, they are fascinating because they have got a massive diversity of uh, fruit morphologies with wings or spines with barbs on them that get stuck in your socks or in the fur of animals. Uh, and uh, one single species that doesn't have that which is fittingly called calotis inanis, the unarmed one. And on the left here, snow daisies, Selmisia, they're closely related to uh, Olearia. These uh, are mostly up in the Alps, and they've got even larger diversity in New Zealand, if that genus is correctly uh, circumscribed. And then the one on the right doesn't look like very much, but that is my little anecdote uh, with Vicky Funk. Um, I obviously haven't interacted as much as, uh, as uh, people in North America, but a few years ago, she was um, giving a keynote at a conference here in Canberra, and uh, we did a little trip across one of the local nature reserves, and it was a pretty good spring. There were carpets of paper daisies in white and yellow around us, and, and I was showing her and uh, Ilse Breitwieser from New Zealand, who's also online, I've seen, uh, what our local daisy flora is like, but then uh, Vicky said, look, do you have Vitadinia here? And I said, oh yeah, I think we're along the path I can find it because she had never seen that before. And I just, just, just left a lasting impression with me how happy she was to see a Vitadinia for the first time uh, because you know <laughs> that's the real plant nerd who gets super excited about this while, while there's carpets of other plants around us. And coming then finally uh, to the biogeographic aspect of it, uh, just in terms of pure species numbers, we're going to look at something more derived at the end of the talk very quickly. Where is actually the diversity in Australia? So as you will know that uh, you will know that the southwest of the continent is a global biodiversity hotspot with enormous amounts of endemic flora. And so we, you will not be surprised to see that that is a center of diversity also for the daisies. But I would say the larger hotspots are actually, the, the richer hotspots are actually in the southeast um, with, you know, lots of species in the alpine uh, areas in Tasmania and then along the Great Dividing Range. So um, this is partly because of where the different tribes have got their centers of diversity. Of the three big ones, the Asteria and the Sinisonia clearly have their centers of diversity in the southeast. And it is only the Nafali that is kind of, you know, half-half with lots of species in the southwest also. Now, this is just a very, very general overview of what our daisy flora looks like. Now to the more specific issues. The first one, as I said, has already been published and some of you may have seen it, but uh, I assume not all of you have seen it. And also, I think this is an extremely nice story about the practical impact that our phylogenetic and taxonomic work can have, um, you know, to people working in other areas. So I thought this, this would be a really good introduction here and also, uh, it was an actually surprising result in the end, what we found there that, that I 
that I thought was, you know, really exciting to talk about. Now, where we started here was actually not simply um, from a, shall we say, a biodiversity science or taxonomic um, interest. We started with biodiversity, sorry, with biocontrol research. So I have got this colleague, Ben Gudin in CSR Health and Biosecurity, whose research is about introducing control agents like insects or fungi to kind of even the scores for uh, the introduced species, which don't have enough specialized natural enemies. So it's the, you know, the, the enemy release hypothesis in invasion research, that they grow so copiously, they grow so vigorously and overgrow the native flora because there's not enough enemies. So they try to bring something in, and in Ben's case, it's insects, um, to eat the introduced plants and kind of knock them down a bit. And the big question, of course, uh, is will the native and useful plants be safe if we bring in new insects or new rust fungi or something like that? And uh, therefore, before you're allowed to release something, it will be the same in every other jurisdiction. You have uh, to achieve pretty rigorous testing um, and demonstrate either that your insect, for example, is very, very host specific, or at least that the damage to native flora and some other countries understand it doesn't have to be quite so absolute, that the damage is negligible to uh, non-target species. And so our colleagues there in health and biosecurity then have the question, well, how do they design the test list um, so that they can really make the argument to the regulator that they have done their due diligence and uh, that there is no uh, significant risk to native flora. And the state of the art in biocontrol research is the so-called centrifugal method, um, originally based more on you know, the taxonomic classifications today, based on molecular phylogenies, of course, where the idea is that you cover different, they call that degrees of separation from the target weed. So you would not just say, oh, I'm going to test three close related species, then I'm done. But you go through the phylogeny and you say, OK, every every major lineage along the way, the further we go down in, you know, divergence uh, along the phylogenetic tree, we want to sample a bit here and a bit there, and then we can really see uh, across a variety of lineages whether the uh, control agent is specific and uh, where it drops off if it isn't. So that ensures then that no relevant lineage is overlooked in design. Um, and it takes a bit into account, of course, then also your uncertainty that the phylogeny might not have gotten it quite right who the closest relatives are. But at any rate, you need to have an understanding of the evolutionary relationships you need a phylogeny. So in this case, what are we dealing with? Um, you know, well, the weeds are probably familiar to uh, people. So a few of the ones we have in, in Australia, and that's obviously not uh, exhaustive. This is uh, ragwort, Jacobea vulgaris, when I saw it on a, on a field trip in Tasmania, for example. That's one that I'm familiar with as a, you know, or as a student all the way back in Germany. Um, the same for this one, Sinisio vulgaris, uh, this one in an apple orchard in southern Queensland. And from the same locality, actually, Sinusa madagascariensis fireweed. This is one of the top 14 uh, most concerning weeds in Australia at the moment. So there's a lot of research going into where this particular species came from with various introductions and how to control it. And this is the one that my colleague, well, well, fireweed and this one are the ones that my colleague in health and biosecurity actually first uh, started uh, to contact me about, uh, Cape Ivy from South Africa. A vine, as you can see, that's more or less native vegetation. And so, for comparison, then what are the native species we're most immediately concerned about? Um, native Sinisionia, just a few uh, nice species, starting perhaps the ones I like best. We've got this little group of um, Bedfordia and uh, Central Puppus slash Brachyglottis here. I think they should probably all be in the New Zealand genus Brachyglottis, but at the moment they're segregated out. Uh, that are um, little treelets, quite attractive looking here. This one blanket leaf from our area here where it's a bit wetter. And then uh, the so-called Tasmanian daisy tree, uh, central puppus or Brachyglottis prunonis, which only grows on a few mountain tops in Tasmania. It's just probably just a few thousand individuals actually. And then the genus Sinisio itself, of course, where we also got the odd little thing uh, here or there, you know, like Jane um, uh, Janura, for example, I'm focusing on the ones that I've actually photographed myself in the field. 
So at the other end of the of the attractivity spectrum, you could say attractiveness spectrum is Sinisa quadrientata, one of the native daisy species that actually can grow as a weed, quite robust. Um, Sinisio gunnii up in the Alps. And Sinisio odoratus, in this case on Kangaroo Island, as the name implies, a very, very smelly species. And a completely different morphology here, and that's the one to keep in mind for the results, then Sinisio pectinatus, part of a little group of uh, alpine rosetti species with quite attractive large flower heads. So, Given that problem, then what phylogenies were available? My colleague uh, depicted here in his experimental class has looked into the daisy uh, literature. Now his background is plant ecology, so he certainly understands plants, but uh, he was effectively faced with a convoluted super tree problem because there were phylogenies that were broadly sampled, but not very deeply, especially the early ones where you had uh, very little Australian species sampled, for example, but you know, people were still trying to resolve the subtribal classification. And then you had lots of studies that were focused on this Australian clade or that or this other genus here, but he couldn't really put it together. So when he approached me, um, we decided, well, the best thing to do is probably we raid GenBank and we make a really large phylogeny of all available sequence data and fill in some Australian gaps that hadn't been sequenced yet. And that would then inform uh, the design of this biocontrol test list. So just very quickly, although this is probably the less, less, less interesting part, uh, the gene regions that were most available for this group uh, were the usual suspects, uh, internal transcript spacer, external transcript spacer, um, and then the crow plus TRNL and PSBA TRNH regions. So I got all the Sinisonia and related Doronicum. We sequenced another 32 species, nearly all native ones, but also a few weeds. Um, MAFT alignment, uh, we did separate nuclear and chloroplast phylogenies because of known incongruences there, although, although not for the main results we care about, as you will see. And then I used IQ tree for uh, the phylogenetics. And these are the results. So I've marked the important stuff with those colorful boxes. Uh, on the left, you see the ribosomal phylogeny. On the right, you see the chloroplast phylogeny. And uh, the first outcome that we had is, um, so there, there are three uh, ribosomal and three chloroplast clades that have been known that I've marked here in red, green, and blue up in the gray senescent sense stricto box. And if we then blow that up a bit and collapse the non-interesting clades, you can see here uh, perhaps um, that all the species that are in black and bold font are the newly sequenced ones. So there are quite a few, especially in the quadrilantatus group uh, at the bottom of the tree, that we can now place in the phylogeny and in their species groups that hadn't been sequenced before. So, so that was the kind of result that we expected, that you know, we get a bit of a better understanding of where everything goes. But much more curious are these other little boxes that I've made here uh, that I'm indicating with the arrows. So in those places here, we see a bunch of newly sequenced Sinesios and, and species that had nobody had ever really suspected would be anything other than Sinesio in any taxonomic treatment or floristic treatment in the past, that fall actually very far outside of Sinesio sensus stricto and Sinesio in its current circumscription in both phylogenies. And that was, um, well, as you can imagine, very unexpected, so we needed to take a closer look at those. This is then the relevant clade down there blown up. And as you can see here in the ribosomal phylogeny, the chloroplast one is slightly different, but also much less well supported. You see there are two clades. Again, the, the bold, uh, bold species are the ones that we have newly sequenced. You can see two clades forming a little grade that leads up to the adenostylenia or the quadridentate group, which is a northern hemisphere, mostly mountain dwelling. Uh, group, which is not what we would expect by geography, uh, as you know, the, the next relatives of those Australian lineages here. And so I'm, I'm still kind of a bit puzzled how that worked and, and what, how many side lineages we might be missing here. And I hope that more data in the future from, you know, the sequence and ritual shed a bit of light on it. At any rate, there, there are now two clades that we didn't really know about. And the first one is uh, this little arrow he indicates is suddenly we have got something around the previously isolated uh, genus Lord Howier. So let's take a closer look at that one. Lord Howier and Solaris is um, perhaps unsurprisingly endemic to the Lord Howe Islands, after which it has been named. It is a 
this is a little shrub um and uh it has so far in in a really old chloroplast phylogeny it's come out a sister to a little thing that's been uh you know that's endemic to uh the cape of south africa and uh that also doesn't make an enormous amount of sense if you compare the two and you think well they, they really haven't got much in common um and they're far away so, so there was clearly something missing there something something strange going on so have we now discovered the australian main relatives um is there more evidence than just ribosomal data first of all what does that all look like so lord Howard and solaris is here in the lower right corner and the other three species that come out with it around it and yes, I mean, they, they do have quite a few things in common. They're all, in all cases, fairly robust things, you know, either very strong, slightly woody herbs, or in the case of Sinisa amygdaloides, uh, something a bit like a, like a weak shrub. And then only Lord Howe is more shrubby, which is, of course, something that often happens in islands. And they all have got uh, radiate uh, flower heads, and they all have got uh, pretty rich corymbs. They all have got undivided uh, leaves in all cases, except Pilosa Christus with Tesis. A lot of immediate uh, similarity there. And it also makes sense in terms of biogeography. So much closer geographically to Lord Howea. Uh, ignore the red dot and uh, the, the green dot in Canberra, by the way. Um, that's that's a garden specimen. <laughs> so, so you can now kind of plausibly think that, well, maybe some seed has blown over to Lord Howe Island sometime in the past, rather more than from the Cape of South Africa, for example. In this case, actually, somebody has counted chromosome numbers, so they share those two. So that seems like a, like a lot of good evidence that suddenly we know uh, where Lord Howe has come from, and nobody had sequenced these species before. But perhaps even more um, Curious is that uh, the other five species form a lineage far outside of Sinisu that nobody had ever thought about. And this is uh, around that Rossetti species that uh, I have I had shown the photo at the end of the introduction to the Sinisu Neo of Australia. So in this case, we've got a lineage of five previously unsequenced species that are all uh, scapose in their morphology. So, so the leaves are either in a rosette or at least concentrated at the base of the, of the plant. Um, some of them are Stoloniferous, and uh, they all have got uh, very few, usually one, sometimes up to five flower heads uh, on, on very elongated scapes with uh, reduced leaves. Unfortunately, in this case, we don't know that much uh, about other characters that might unite them, apart from the fact that, you know, they, they have got no hairs on the fruits, but nobody has really done the cytology there, so only one species has been counted with 80 chromosomes. But it makes sense by geographically. The, this new lineage is entirely endemic to Tasmania, except for one species that has uh, struck out into the mainland Alps, presumably sometime during the Ice Ages. So I would really like to do a bit more research on this peculiar little new lineage here um, that we know so little about. Unfortunately, as you can also see from those uh, colored dots here, two of the five species are really, really hard to get. They only occur in remote parts of the southwestern wilderness of Tasmania. And actually, I asked the Tasmanian colleague that I collaborated with a few years ago if he could bring me some more samples of uh, those two species. And she said, well, that's not going to happen very soon. And I said, well, but you've collected them before. Like, I know you've collected Sinisio primulifolius twice. And he said, well, yeah, I had a helicopter at that time. So that's probably something that if, if I want more of those, there's going to be some real investment in a hiking trip once uh, COVID allows us to travel more freely again. So taxonomic outcomes then again published last year. In the case of Lord Howe, we now have the peculiar situation that uh, that genus, which was named after the island, has now been expanded uh, to four species, three of which are uh, on the mainland. And uh, Usually you get complaints if you sink an island genus into a mainland genus because people then are concerned, you know, now, now the island flora is less marked as distinctive and I hate these name changes. I've yet to see complaints, but I'm sure they will come where people find it absolutely unintuitive that we've got mainland species named Lord Howe are so <laughs> still waiting for that. And in the other case, uh, our little unexpected alpine lineage uh, has no pre-existing name, so uh, it needs a new one because the other alternative is basically to lump everything, including the the uh, um, the, the quadridentate ones from you know, several genera from the northern hemisphere. So we describe that as a new genus Scapi Sinisio after those flowering scapes. 
which I think has a lot of precedent in, in the Sinicio Neo with things like Dendro Sinicio and Sino Sinicio. Um, and two important outcomes of this, I think, first of all, it was a really nice uh, communications opportunity, a really nice outreach and, and you know, science, uh, uh, popular science opportunity, because this whole story about how uh, we have this, you know, this, this interlocking between the need to have a phylogeny for really applied question for designing those biocontrol tests, and then having this biodiversity outcome that was so unexpected. So, so both demonstrating how our collections and our biodiversity science is important to achieve a practical uh, outcome, and then how the practical question led to this unexpected discovery. That was a really nice story. So we had you know, this little conversation article here, and I actually gave three radio interviews on that. And I can only recommend um, doing that if you've got similarly uh, you know, curious results to try that, because it can be quite rewarding. And then the other practical outcome, of course, uh, for fireweed in this case, the test list has already been published and uh, opened up for feedback from the community. Coming to the other half of the talk, the diversity of the Australian Nephali, and that is really the group that I have uh, mostly focused on since I started at CSRO, since I started with the Australian National Herbarium. Uh, the most part of what I'm going to talk about now is about the phylogeny and then the four little groups that I found in the Australian Nephali, and then I'm going to end uh, with a few words on phylogenetic diversity of the group, just a very interesting observation that uh, a student project produced a few years ago. So Nephali, uh, might be not saying anything really new now. It's part of the uh, five large tribes clade in the Asteroidae together with Sinicio, Nia, Asteria, uh, Calendulia, and um, well, the Nephalia himself, sorry. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of uh, confusion in the literature with you know, species numbers around like 1,300 or so being cited, but um, if you add up all the genera, you quickly realize that can't be right, and uh, there must be a bit over 2,000 species actually uh, globally, a fairly cosmopolitan tribe, and relatively uh, easily recognized with a typical representative. So also, there are exceptions to most characters, except for a few African genera, they don't have ray florets, they've lost those, although some Australian texts are trying to reinvent them. Uh, they usually, but not always, again, even in Australia, we've got exceptions, have papery or uh, scarious involucral bracts, and they generally have got an undivided leaf with entire margins. Again, some very rare exceptions are uh, serrate, but that's, you know, usual nephali. And uh, just last year, under the in lead of Rob Smithson from New Zealand, uh, quite a few of us got together and published a new suggestion for a subtribal classification of the Nephali. So this is the rubbers on the tree from that paper. And uh, the suggestion, because you can see that quite a few of the internal branches are not well supported and we still don't really understand the internal relationships. The suggestion we've made is just to recognize two subtribes for the moment. Um, the largely African and Mediterranean Relhani Ine, which are about 124 species, and then all the rest, which are sister to them as the Nafeli Ine, with uh, you know, the largest number of species and cosmopolitan. In the Nafeli Ine, there are three really large traits, uh, so really large clades. Uh, two of them are widespread and uh, named after some genera that are included in them. So in one case, you know, uh, Illichrysum dominates the hard clade and uh, genera like uh, Leontopodium and, and uh, Anaphalis, um, sorry, Antenaria. Leontopodium and Antenaria dominate the flag clade. And the third one is simply called after its occurrence, which is the Australasian clade. So the vast majority of um, Australian species belong to this one clade. There's just a few, like I think we've got two nephaliums and a pseudo nephalium. So there's just a few that have come in from elsewhere naturally, but nearly everything is in this group. And so this is what I'm focusing on now. 
in this clade in Australia, uh, we have got definite problems with, I'm not saying there's an enormous numbers of species that are undiscovered, we've got definite problems with the genus level classification, which is not really based on phylogenetic information. And in particular, we've got, especially compared to the other daisy groups in Australia, we've got an excessive number of monotypic genera. Uh, of which clearly a lot are uh, apomorphic segregates. In particular, you know, this is just like that other larger genus, but it has lost the pappus, or it's just like this other medium-sized genus, but it has got receptacle scales. So what we have got available to make sense of that group so far is uh, nuclear and chloroplast space of phylogenies. Um, just Nuclear and uh, chloroplast space of phylogeny, starting with a uh, paper in 2002 by Bayer at, uh, by Randy Bayer and his uh, team, uh, which was you know relatively broadly sampled across the group, and then a few more densely sampled but genus focused studies. But in all cases, we've got the usual problems with uh, the traditional Sanger markers. We've got relatively limited resolution and support values for deeper nodes. We've got some incongruence between ribosome and chloroplast data. And we also often have got problems to really resolve the finer scale relationships. So uh, I did a first attempt then at uh, using the composite uh, 1061 bait set published by uh, Mandel uh, and her team. And then also to try to assemble a bunch of chloroplast genes for comparison from skimming. So again, don't wanna to dwell too long on the, on the methods here, but effectively uh, the chloroplast genes I got were just protein coding genes, um, just concatenated them all into the likelihood phylogeny. In the case of the uh, conserved ortholog sets, the, the composite enrichment kit, um, I used Tide Piper to assemble, uh, including uh, the paralog finder function, and then I uh, simply removed all the genes where paralogs were found after finding that the alternative options of you know trying trying to make use of them didn't really add anything. And I did both a concatenated analysis with IQ tree and a uh, astral analysis, which I am not showing here because the results were pretty unresolved in comparison to the concatenated one, but not really. Um, except in one or two unplausible uh, cases, like Antenaria jumping into my in-group, um, not really different from, uh, from the other one, just mostly very poorly resolved. So the results very quickly, um, I found four major clades, and then Crispedia is really floating around a bit unhappily here. So as you can see in this nuclear phylogeny, this US phylogeny, We've got a little group at the bottom in this uh, light blue, the Eukaitan clade, uh, I would call it for the moment, the Cassinia clade in darker blue, and uh, then the white seer clade and the Angiantis clade at the top, and Crispedia, rather surprisingly, perhaps you can immediately see, um, if, you, if you look at those example photos I've chosen, I would have expected that to come out in the Angiantis clade, actually. And then for comparison of the chloroplast says, uh, in this case, Crispedia is what I would have expected it as part of the Angiantus clade, clade but uh, then we have got the Cassinia clade split up into two different chloroplast clades here. So to see whether these groups make a lot of sense, then of course the key point is now to look at what they are and to show a number of example photos to you know, get a bit of an impression of the Australian Nephali flora. Again, it's nearly half of our, our native diversity that we see in this tree, basically. So starting with the Eukaitan clade, um, that is uh, the smallest of them. So uh, we got a few things that might go there, uh, especially in New Zealand that we haven't sampled yet. But from things that we have sampled, we would say, you know, less than, than 30 species that we know that go in there. They are cutweed-like genera, like Eukaitan argyrotegium and Stuartina, for example, and then uh, a bunch of alpine cushion plants um, that are either in the same genera and others like Awartia. Uh, again, may have its actual hotspot in New Zealand, but uh, for the ones that we've sequenced in Australia, they're clearly concentrated in the southeast of the continent. Um, and the question here is, uh, as, as you will see in the, in the, in the phylogeny here, the, the one risk that we might look at if we look at the branch length distributions here, uh, the 
clade has the shortest branches of them all. So if there is an issue of long branch attraction, then things might jump out of it uh, if it is in reality a grade. So we might, might want to you know, have a little caveat here. But in, in these analysis, consistently in all the data sets, it, it comes out as, as a little clade. And just to show a bit more of its diversity, here's a, you know, on the left, one of those cutweeds growing in a local swamp uh, relatively close to where I live. And on the right, we already got an alpine species, the genus Argyrotegium. Um, and here, one of the cushion plants up in Kosiola National Park in the alpine zone of Australia, Argyrotegium nitidulum. And one of my, my favorites in this group, Avartian rubigena, little little attractive paper, Daisy Cushion. The second uh, clade, and this one is already quite large, pro probably around 100 species, is uh, effectively the shrubby nephali, except for one or two that, that are in other clays, except effectively the shrubby clade. And uh, people who know the, the South African form actually um, find it quite interesting how similar many of these species are to Metallasia, which is, is the South African shrubby nephalia. It's a really convergent morphology here. So in this case, uh, rich, generally rich corims, uh, sometimes pyramidal inflorescences with uh, small capitula. In extreme cases, only one or two florets per capitulum and uh, uh, effectively shrubby um, morphology. Now, uh, in its internal structure, pretty much everything seems to be um, nested inside the genus Osotamnus. So in the end, it makes sense uh, to actually just turn that all into just one large genus, Cassinia, the name of which has been protected against all the others. And it's really interesting in its diversity. So very, very typical and generic Cassinia is here on the left with really, really rich corums. Then an Osotamnus uh, with similar corums, but a different leaf morphology here on the right. That one is from Tasmania. Um, then we've got quite a lot of alpine species also, Osotamnus alpinus, which it's really, really attractive uh, white and red colored bracts uh, here just opening its flowers. And another alpine species was Atanus cuprasoides with uh, these, these really um, scale leaves. But if you want to see really bizarre leaves, then the one on the left is where you have to go through. So there is Osotamnus scutellifolius, the shield leafed Osotamnus. That is a Tasmanian species, and in fact, part of a little clade of, I think, four species of, Oso, of Tasmanian Osotamnus. Uh, that are all characterized by having a marked difference between the juvenile leaves and the mature leaves. So they, they start with completely different foliage and then switch as a seedling. Unfortunately, of those four species in that clade, one of them is already extinct, has never been collected since the 19th century. Another one is known just from one hill around Hobart. So, uh, <laughs> but a very curious little group there. Then on the right, we see the, the pyramidal uh, morphology in Cassinia in particular, um, Cassinia concofaria, perhaps not the most attractive species we've got, but that's one of the local ones around here where I live. And then in the extreme, this, this truly bizarre species on the left, Calomeria amarantoides, which is uh, more or less a biennial uh, semi-shrub, you could say, which is this absolutely weird, uh, rather non-daisy looking in fluorescents. And on the right, at the other end of the spectrum, one of the groups with the larger, you know, uh, more uh, floriferous flower heads, uh, Exodia, which is, you know, really around South Australia, uh, is also interesting because it has got extremely resinous uh, leaves that, that are very sticky. Uh, sorry about the background noise, by the way. Then the two really large clades are the, are the two other ones, the white seer clade and the angiantus clade, um, and they are herbaceous predominantly. The white seer clade has got many perennial herbs, um, uh, a few annuals, and uh, generally, well, always simple capitula, and they either everlast things like here on the right, you know, with papery bracts or uh, button daisies without radiating bracts. This is pretty equivalent to the white seer group recognized by Underberg in his treatment. A few examples here, a paper daisy from the Alps that I'm rather fond of, Leucochrysum alpinum. Um, actually, one of the species in this genus that's quite similar, but uh, occurring at lower elevations, we just got funded for genome sequencing uh, a few months ago. So that's going to be the first Australian 
I think the first Australian daisy actually is getting its genome sequenced. Um, Chrysocephalum apiculatum is a ridiculously uh, morphologically diverse species. The latest treatment recognized more than 20 subspecies here, and it's also sometimes grown as an ornamental. Leptorhynchus squamatus, then one of the button daisies I mentioned. This one is called scaly buttons. And Podolipus mulleri uh, is a genus where some species are actually trying to reinvent the ray floor. It's so um, they, they look a bit less organized uh, in those species than they do in the Asteria or Sinesionia, but uh, they're trying again. And then finally, the Angiantus clade. Um, this is the only clade that is really centered very, very strongly on southwestern Australia. The question is now whether it includes Crispedia or not. If it doesn't include Crispedia, then it is endemic to Australia. Otherwise, we share it with New Zealand. And Crispedia is actually a bit the outlier here. Most of the clade are fairly uh, ephemeral herbs in southwestern Australia or in the arid zone. And they often have got compound capitula, although there are some everlastings too. And this is then, if we compare against the previous treatments, it is more or less equivalent to the Angiantus group of Anderberg's taxonomic treatment, but also includes a variety of genera that he placed completely elsewhere. So this is in, its, in this circumscription as indicated by the phylogenetic analysis, it seems to be um, something that nobody had quite had on the radar like that. So to show a few examples, again, starting with the everlasting, Srodantic chlorocephala is, is a very common, uh, commonly planted annual ornamental. And here this photo actually has two. What I meant to photograph was the hylosperma, the, the larger yellow one, hylosperma semisterily, another everlasting. And then the little white stuff in between is, is a dwarf Rodantia, a really short-lived uh, arid zone species, Rodantia pygmaea. And coming to the, to the compound capitula that are much more common in this group, again, two species on this photo, Calocephalus francesia, where you can really see the individual uh, capitula quite well. And on the right, Nephosis tenuissima, shortly before starting to flower. But it gets water. So uh, people from Europe may uh, know Evax another little genus of, you know, ground hogging annual daisies. So this one has been named after it. Uh, lit literally, I think it means something like the ground heads that kind of look a bit like the genus Ebex. And then uh, Siloxorus, another, another arid zone ephemeral. Uh, this is one that I collected in Western Australia around a salt lake and was actually one where I was kind of dubious whether it was a daisy when I picked it first up. And I hadn't figured out what species or what genus of daisies it was by the time my field trip came to an end and I spoke to the uh, then uh, director of the Western Australian Herbarium and, and he flipped open his laptop and showed me another photo and uh, this was only the 10th collection that had ever been made of this species, probably not because it's that rare, but because it's uh, something that few people would, would think of picking up or, or actually identifying as a daisy, I think, if, if they just walk over it. One of my favorites in this trade is this one here, Actinoboli condensatum from Western Australia. Um, And to end on the really, really tiny ones uh, on the left, we've got another nephosis. So this, this whole plant is, well, it's like three quarters, just one compound head uh, that has taken a very you know, spike-like appearance. Um, sometimes I've collected them, uh, you know, with the, the mother plant still attached to the roots. So they, they just, you know, die and fall over and then something grows out of the, the decomposing mother plant, the next generation. And then on the right, I think if, if you really think about what that means, you know, in comparison to my thumbnail there, I think this may well be the smallest daisy we've got uh, in Australia. This is in, in full bloom, you could say, uh, Halosperma dimison, really, really tiny. And then finally, Crispedia. Um, again, I would suspect if we get in a bit more resolution, a bit more data, I would suspect it's probably uh, part of the of the Angiantus clade, but uh, chloro, uh, the, sorry, the, the nuclear data so far say differently. Um, Crispedia in the wider sense is two genera. Um, Crispedia is mostly in the mountains and in New Zealand, and Pycnosaurus is more of an inland genus. Uh, Crispedia is, is scapos, rosette herbs, and pygnosaurus is a bit more branched. 
So um, just two examples of Crispedia here, a white one from the mountains, and here uh, an orange one also from up in the Alpine zone. And then just as an example, a Pipnosaurus, and this really looks like quite like something from the Angiantos clade, I would argue. And finally, the last few comments I wanted to make, and this is this is just an interesting observation that we had. So you look at the phylogenies, you know, both uh, the traditional ones, you know, uh, traditional chloroplast spaces, and now the ones we've produced here, um, with you know the the COS marker on the left and the chloroplast on the right. Uh, you see that we've got massive branch length variation. I already alluded to that with uh, reference to the Eukaitan clay. So Eukaitan and Cassinia clay have got really short branches, and then uh, in particular the Angiantis clay in red has got really long ones. And there could both be um, an effect here of their life cycles, because uh, again, you know, alpine cushion plants and, and shrubs with the short branches and herbaceous plants in the lowlands with the long ones, in particular than ephemerals with really short generation times. But there could also be an effect just of the uh, physiology of depending on where they live, um, um, because again, the Angiantus clade is, is in hot areas, is in the arid zone in Western Australia, for example. But whatever the reason there, there are really big differences here. And so why that is of interest to me is this concept of phylogenetic diversity. Um, again, a lot of you will be familiar with that, but just for those who may not have looked into that yet. So if we're interested in um, understanding the diversity of different areas, doing a special analysis, comparing diversity scores, maybe should we put a conservation zone you know, area here or there? We might just count species. We might look at endemism, you know, how rare are the species, or we might want to have a metric of phylogenetic diversity. Well, we just ask ourselves, okay, how much of the tree of life do we conserve in this area? How much of the tree of life has accumulated in this area, if you've got a biogeographic uh, question? And so the, the, the key idea is that an area with one thistle, one dandelion, and it should count more than 10 species of closely related thistles because you've got more of the tree of life in the former area, even though you've got less species. And the way this is calculated, uh, phylogenetic diversity, as, as uh, developed by Dan Faith many years ago, is as the union of the branch lengths connecting the tree terminals you've got in your area to the root of the tree. And so on the right, you can see what the effect is. If you've got three close related species, um, you, you mark everything red that goes into the phylogenetic diversity score in that phylogeny, then you get much less branch length uh, union out of it than on the, on the lower phylogeny where you've got very distantly related species. And you can already imagine where this is going. Uh, if, uh, so these, these are just two examples of uh, how that has been used in the vascular flora of Chile, for example, and in the flora of Australia to, to identify hotspots of phylogenetic diversity. Um, anyway, where you can see where this is going then with the, the branch length. So the question is then, um, what branch lengths are we talking about? Because we can have a phylogram as we would get out of IQT or XML, for example, which a lot of people are using for these big data sets. And then the branch lengths you're adding up are the um, likelihood of trade changes along the branches, uh, the, you know, the, the substitution rate estimates. Whereas if you're using a time calibrated tree, then uh, you have got um, a ultrametric tree shape. Uh, so that immediately makes a completely different branch length distribution for the same kind of, uh, you know, for the same content of species in your area. And I realized a few years ago that nobody had really systematically looked at it. So I made a little student project um, with, with a, you know, vacation scholar we had to just, you know, look at, okay, let's, let's say we take a few trees, um, existing data and my own data and a faily, and we once do the analysis with the phylogram that we get, and then we time calibrate it and uh, see if there actually are any differences. And then she also did a literature review, just looking at, well, how often have people used either phylogram or conogram and have they given an explanation? And uh, don't really need to go into the results here in any length, but uh, effectively it's pretty much 50-50 and people hadn't really thought about it apparently of why they picked either phylogram or chronogram. It seemed more like, well, I know how to run Rexanel, so I'm using that one. And uh, then the results uh, were actually the most striking in the Nafali. So we had we had another group where we get, got quite some dramatic shifts, but nothing was as dramatic as this one here. 
if you do that with an Afaili, um, in this case, you know, with a, with a traditional at that moment, we had the ribosomal data, for example, um, you use the phylogram that you get directly out of Rexamel, which is again, you know, it's what 50% of the studies in this area would have done. Uh, you get all the hotspots in the Southwest. If, however, then you take that tree and you time calibrate it, in this case, using penalized likelihood so that the topology stays the same, we don't get any clock routing effects, then suddenly you get virtually all the hotspots in the Southeast. And if we think again about those major clades of Australian failure, it's fairly clear what's going on there. In the case of the phylogram, uh, you get all the long branches in the Angiantis group uh, that are your, your hotspots, basically driving your hotspots. Whereas if you time calibrate the tree, then uh, the greater diversity of groups in the southeast actually uh, weigh that out because, because you get the Eukaitan clade and the, uh, you get all four clades represented very well in the southeast. And suddenly you actually have got greater phylogenetic diversity there and not just greater branch lengths. So really, it's not the, the key point here. I would just say, well, we looked at this, we went, oh dear. Um, <laughs> that, that was really quite striking. So this, this was what I wanted to show um, just quickly, the people who have helped me with this work. So uh, our data technician, Nonsu Knur, is really crucial to all of the spatial studies we have done, including the phylogenetic diversity. The student who led that was uh, Mac Elliott. Um, our technician, Jess Bovell, uh, helped me with an Afaili lab work. Unfortunately, she uh, died at a fairly uh, young age, end of last year before she saw this work published. And then my co-authors on the Sinisio Nia work are again Ben Gooden from the Biocontrol Research Unit, uh, Isabel Sarolfi, who did the lab work, and uh, our herbarium curator, Brendan Lepschi, uh, who helped me with some of the nomenclature identification issues. I would like just very quickly to mention that uh, this July, uh, we have got our Australasian Systematic Botany Society conference, uh, nominally in Cairns, but really virtual under the impression of um, uh, the pandemic. And I have been asked to organize an Asteraceae or Composite session on that. So if there are people who would, uh, you know, consider maybe signing up because they might have a biogeographic interest in connecting with Australian colleagues or want to look into this now that, you know, travel is not so much an issue anymore. Um, please have, have a chat with me if you're interested in, in contributing to a DAISY symposium. So thank you very much. Um, I I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. And uh, in case nobody has any, maybe, uh, you know, everybody who doesn't already know the flora uh, so well uh, might have a go at uh, guessing what tribe this is actually here on the right. Um, one of the more bizarre daisies that we have. Thank you. I am not going to attempt to guess that, but I do have a question, um, and I wanted to say thank you. Um, that was an awesome talk and great pictures, and what a cool idea for a student project too at the end. So thank you again for that talk. Um, I was going to ask you about the paralogs, and I think you said you used Hyde Piper, and did you say you had to throw out par paralogs? Or I guess I was going to ask more question, kind of if you could speak more about the paralog analysis. That you did. Oh yeah, well, that's 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 a very very long story. Um, so <laughs> maybe <essentially, offline. laughs> Yeah, no, no, no. Just just very quickly because it, it is gonna just be ever more important as we're starting to to use more of this kind of data. Um, so uh, what I have used, um, and again, I did a primitive way out. Now, what I have used is is this pipeline of Yang and Smith from two thousand and fourteen. Um, if, if you're interested, uh, I, you know, I can send you, but, but you can probably just Google it with that information, just Yang and Smith 2014 paralox or orthodox or whatever, you, you get it. Um, they provided four scripts with different kinds of approaches to dealing with paralogs. The most simple one just basically throws everything out that, yeah, every gene out that has paralox. And that's what I did in the end because I didn't lose any, any uh, big information in this case. 
But for the Genomics for Australia, Australian Plants Consortium, we now have got a, um, a, a singularity container that implements that pipeline to take the output of High Piper specifically. Um, and you can then play around once we've got that published, which will happen very soon. You can then play around with all four of their approaches in, in a very user friendly fashion. So the other ones basically take the gene tree for every gene and then try to find out based on on that topology, what the ortholog groups may be. So, so you can imagine how it works the same way we would look at that. And, you know, visually we see, oh, part of the phylogeny is again replicated here with, you know, a subset of the same species. So that must be one ortholog group and that must be one ortholog group. Um, so so that those are gene tree topology based approaches that I would use in those cases. Thanks, yeah, I have seen that paper and I'm just posting. Oh, yeah, there's another one that has just come out in CISBio that has implemented that. And I wondered, I, I just posted it. So maybe we can talk later. I'm really interested yeah. in what you talked about that you're publishing soon. So we haven't tried this yeah. out yet. Thanks. Great talk, Alexander. I had a question for you. Um, it was great, by the way, to see all of the pictures of the amazing diversity in Australia. And it definitely trumps the diversity that we have here in North America of paper daisies. Um, I was interested to, to, to find out if when you did your dating analysis of the phylogeny using penalized likelihood, if you just used like an uninformative date or whether you did like a, a more formal dating analysis and compared with like the history of, um, I don't know, maybe biome change or, or geography in, in Australia. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, we've got more than a faily diversity here, but in daisies overall, we actually, you know, don't hold a candle against North America, I would say. <laughs> yeah, um, so, so in this case, uh, there is a secondary calibration point. We don't really have any fossils here that I'm aware of. There was a secondary calibration point where I just said, okay, the route is, you know, around 15 million years or something like that, because that's what came out of previous studies where they, you know, had, had used more distant fossils than they estimated maybe the whole australian shebang is just 50 million plus minus five or something like that which, which i find astounding given the diversity we've got in terms of ecology and morphology so I still find that a bit tough to believe but really it did not matter so much I, I think the key point in all the cases and it really differed from study to study so for example we also did one on the ferns of australia and there we had much more sensible various calibration points the key point for us was just basically to make the tree you know a chronogram whether whether you know this or this subplate then makes that much by graphical sense you would rather have four calibration points instead that didn't really matter for the the impact of that we saw on the spatial results so we, we tried a variety of things uh, you know, the, the, the key problem is i guess if you've got major branch length variation in your group associated with some kind of biogeography then it really matters what you're doing and it's actually an open question then with what you should be doing i guess it depends on what your interpretation is, is right are you after areas where a lot of Diversity has accumulated in terms of traits, and you can make the argument that your trait diversity will be correlated with, I don't know, um, ITS sequence. This is probably a long bow to draw, but if that's your argument, then you would use the, the phylogram. If, on the other hand, you, you say, well, I'm interested where the evolutionary history is accumulated in terms of, you know, relatedness, then I would use the chronogram, because to me, to me, just that is what relatedness is, right? How far away is your common ancestor in time? And not how long is your is your I don't know, TRNL TRNF branch. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, sorry, that was a very long answer. <laughs> no takers on isoetopsis yet. Um, I have a, a question regarding that. Uh, can you see there? Uh, my, my my name is Mauricio. By the way, I'm using my son's computer because mine uh, got an issue. That's why I got late to your talk. Sorry about that. Uh, are those leaves divided leaves or just very thin leaves? Oh, they they undivided. Undivided. Yeah. But yes, Antimedia was one of the earliest suggestions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Turned out to yeah. be wrong, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it was it was kind of going that way, but I don't know. You know, there's something on the on the fillaries that kind of suggests that, but uh, mm. is there? A, you know, there's no scale, but I'm guessing that it's pretty tiny. This as well. Yeah, I mean, of course, you can't really see the small character, so it's it's a bit unfair, of course. I mean, this 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 is really unfair because people were struggling, you know, to place it before molecular data came in. But I put that in there just to again, you know, drive home the weirdness of what the arid zone adaptations have done to some of our groups. Because I mean, if nobody wants to have another go, uh, this is actually an asteria. So this this is you know the same tribe as the first ones I showed, you know, with with Brachyscorm and Olearia and all that. Is, is it called isoetopsis because it, it looks like an isoetes, like one of those? Yeah, presumably. <laughs> oh. And in case you need, a, you know, further clarification, graminifolia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I absolutely love that species. It's just so weird. <laughs> Well, if, there, if there's no other questions, I'll stop the recording now. But thank you so much, Alexander. That was an amazing talk. Thank you so much. Everybody can applaud. If you want, everybody wants to unmute themselves and applaud. Thanks, Alexander. It's awesome. Thank you very much.